I grew up in circles where, and this was, you know, the 90s, right? So evolution was like this huge deal. And we were very anti-evolution. And it was either evolution or God. And so when we were taught things like, you know, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus was on the exact same playing field as evolution or creation story, right? And so, and then I know so many of my friends and youth group people and all that, that, that bought into it wholeheartedly. Then they get to a freshman biology class and they study evolution, like not in a controversial way, just like here's the textbook and here's what's going on. And they become convinced. And Blake, they've been told, right, that like, a Christian does not believe in evolution. And so when they uh, choose to believe in evolution because they think that's the most compelling case that's been presented, they self-select out of Christianity because a Christian doesn't believe in evolution. They think I must not be a Christian anymore. And I just am heartbroken by that. Um, and I I wish that we, and that's a lot of what we do at Restore is trying to equip people um, to handle those kind of conversations. But if people don't, if like you're a professor, right? If you don't have space to ask those questions, voice those doubts, go through that stuff, then um, I think it leads to uh, some really unhealthy places. On today's episode of Rethinking Christianity, we have Zach Lambert, who is a pastor at Restore Austin. Um, Zach, I came across some of your tweets on Twitter, obviously, and you can find him at Zach W. Lambert. Um, I like some of the stuff you present. I like watching you argue with some people on there, too, or sort of argue. Defend your positions is a better way to sure. put it. Um, but, you know, thanks for uh, thanks for coming on today. I'm excited to kind of talk through um just some different things about maybe your background and just uh your following of jesus and what that looks like for you as a as a pastor yeah thanks blake thanks for having me on and um thanks for all the work that you do with the podcast and everything else um benefited from y'all's work as well so it's reciprocal for sure well cool well, i appreciate that so so you're in texas where are you from texas originally yeah i'm, I'm from austin actually so i'm okay. in my, my hometown yeah Nice. How much has Austin changed since you've like grown up? Oh, there? radically, radically. I'm I'm 33, so I was born here in 1988, um, and I'm not sure of the population at that point, but it's uh, been exploding. And <clears throat> really, over the last 10 years, I think it's been in the, the top five, either the city or the county around it, in growth every year for like the last 10 years. And now it's the 11th largest city in America, um, although it's not quite ready to be that. I think in a number of different ways. So. Yeah. We've got some some structural problems and uh, political problems and all of that kind of stuff. But honestly, it's still home for me. And uh, I love all the weirdness. Um, I love the people, the culture, um, how eclectic it is. Um, and uh, obviously, the, the natural beauty that it's been worked hard to preserve in the city and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's my home and uh, my dad's from here. Um, and my kids are from here. And so a lot of generations of Austinites in my family. That's cool. So growing up there, did you grow up like what was your, I guess, faith, the background or church background growing up in in Austin? Yeah, I grew up Southern Baptist. Nice. Um, and yeah, and uh, I grew up at a Southern Baptist megachurch. Uh, I, what I believe was the first megachurch in Austin. Um, and my grandparents, my dad's parents were early members um, of that church when it was kind of young and growing. Um, this was, like I said, the late eighties and nineties. And so this was kind of at the height of what's called the conservative resurgence, um, or the fundamentalist takeover of the Southern Baptist convention. And, uh, that kind of culminated in 2000, uh, with the new Baptist faith and message being written and people being kicked out of all the seminaries and all, all the stuff. So, um, yeah, the church I grew up in was very involved in that, um, a lot of culture warring, uh, and you know, my, my parents who are lovely and awesome, um, but we're, we're caught up in that and we're faithful subscribers to Dr. Dobson and focus on the family. And mm. I tell people that a lot of times I think that, that really four people raised me, my mom, my dad, James Dobson and Rush Limbaugh. Those are really the four <laughs> most prominent voices in my household. Um, and so we, we, we really politically did what Rush Limbaugh said and religiously did what James Dobson said. And so that looked like a myriad of things, but one of the big things was we boycotted stuff a lot. So we were always boycotting Disney or we were 
you know, boycotting the radio station. I remember we boycotted Abercrombie for a while and I, we couldn't afford it anyway. And I always wondered if maybe <laughs> it was because of that uh, rather than the uh, risque catalogs that came out. But yeah, um, that was what I grew up in was Southern Baptist. And um, I was I was that for a really long time, but I was really not super engaged with it. Um, I didn't really buy it, honestly. And I think when you're presented with that much fundamentalism and legalism, um, and that kind of uh, monster God who's just always angry at you. They're really like two choices. You either kind of pretend you have it all together or try to have it all together, kind of fake it till you make it, or you just kind of say, I, I don't want to do this and this is stupid. And and that was really where I was. And so it was a progression of constantly being in trouble in church, being kicked out of you know, children's choir and Sunday school classes and just for causing ruckus or you know, getting in scuffles or um, a lot of it was was asking too many questions or voicing doubts. And when I was when I was 13, um, we had moved to a different church, still Southern Baptist, but kind of farther south, smaller. And I was actually formally kicked out of that youth group when I was 13. Um, I was asking some uh, some questions on a, on a Wednesday night during Bible study, some stuff I didn't believe about um, Jesus on the cross and God turning away and uh, you know, couldn't be around Jesus because of his sin. And I remember asking, I thought you said this God was like good and a good father and kind and loving. And his son is having the worst day of his life. And he just turns away and bails on him. That doesn't sound very loving or like a good father to me. And so I got sent out in the hallway, which was pretty typical. But um, that night, the youth pastor came out to the hallway and said, wait till your parents get here. And I want to talk to you. And he told them, your son is um, asking too many questions and he's causing other kids to doubt their faith. And he is no longer allowed to be a part of my Bible studies or my youth group. So mm -hmm. I still had to come on Wednesday nights. I mean, excuse me, on Sunday mornings, but I was freed from Wednesday nights and uh, the rest of the youth group requirements. So that was a lot of my kind of young journey in faith. That's that's interesting. Consid like, that's just crazy that you're a pastor. It is. That's <laughs> it wild. Is crazy. You yeah. know, I didn't realize the amount of influence that a, like AFR, American Family Radio and all that had on me until... Which I I mean I realize it, but not to the extent I read the book Jesus and John Wayne, yeah. And when I read that book, I was like, oh my gosh, like this is nuts. And um, but I remember the same dude. I remember us like at one point, we were buying like we weren't buying Coke, Coke products, I think, or or maybe it was okay. Pepsi. I can't remember, but it was yeah. like I was having to drink Powerade instead of Gatorade going to soccer <laughs> practice, and I was just like, this is so dumb. Like, oh yeah. And the funny thing I see in it now is, you know, when you get into conversations with similar people in that kind of range of things, especially more conservative people, you know, all about the, you know, boycotting to standing up for stuff. But when it comes to like something they don't want to stand up for, it's like, well, that's yeah. social justice and we're just going <laughs> right. to preach the gospel. I've always found I'm like, so I grew up in a world of like standing up and being so yeah. socially active for the things that they cared about. So yeah, I, you know, that was, I, that was, it was wild to me. The best thing I got out Absolutely. of listening to AFR was adventures and odyssey. Hey, adventures and odyssey still slaps, man. Those are I mean, good. It is, like it holds yeah, up. Yeah. I always like those, but so that's cool. Okay. So you got kicked, got kicked out of youth group. That's, that's what's up. Um, <laughs> nice. Uh, so, you know, like when did you begin to like, Okay, so where did you move from from that place? So you you're at a place where yeah. you were kind of like, for me, I would have just been like, okay, I'm done. Like this ain't. Yeah, I, I was. I, I mean, candidly, yeah, I was. I was done. Um, and I spent most of my junior high and high school years. Um, I uh, played sports and party. That was really all that I did. And um, I was uh, uh, played a number of sports, but was best at football and um, was built like a football player and w was good at football. And that meant that I started hanging out with. Uh, guys especially that were a lot older than me and um, so I just kind of started doing things a little bit younger maybe than before and so I think I, I drank alcohol for the first time when I was like 12 and smoked weed for the first time when I was like 13 and um, yeah just throughout junior high and high school I really just uh, did a lot of drugs the drugs kind of got progressively harder um, did a lot of drugs and uh, partied and played sports and um, was never like I think what would be like a, a typical like uh you know, caricature of like a, a mean jock kind of a thing. I just like really was high a lot and, uh, and, you know, played sports and stuff. And so 
um, what really happened was that the summer before my senior year of high school, I overdosed. And then um, the next out on the lake with some friends. And then the next night um, had uh, saw an acquaintance overdose and drown. Um, and so that began to stir in me a lot of kind of existential questions of like, why am I here? Why is he not here? Um, is God real? And have I misunderstood this? And, and I, in my little 17 year old brain was like, I think I should revisit Christianity. Hmm. And so I started reading the gospels. Um, thankfully I opened the Bible and I didn't start in Genesis. I don't know how long that would have lasted. There, you the got to the, uh, genealogies and been like, that would have been rough. Yeah. That would have been rough. Um, I'd have been out, but yeah. So I started reading the gospels and here's what I realized. Like I realized I knew a ton about the beginning and the end of Jesus's life. I knew Christmas and Easter like that, that had been pounded into me, but I knew nothing about the rest of his life on earth. Um, the, the things that he did, the stories he told, um, the uh, miracles he performed, the way that he was always with the marginalized, the way he was always uplifting the oppressed, the way he was always in trouble with religious and political leaders, like just, just constantly. And I remember vividly reading about his interaction specifically with tax collectors and prostitutes who I really identified with in the story. And I remember Jesus getting in trouble with the religious leaders for hanging out with the tax collectors and prostitutes. And I remember thinking, this guy is willing to get in trouble with the same people I always got in trouble with to hang out with people like me. And it was just mind blowing. And as trite as it sounds, it was kind of like, I'll follow this guy anywhere. Um, th this is incredible. So that's really how I kind of, you know, began to be a follower of Jesus was through that process. Uh, graduated high school, went to college to play football at a, a small school and thought I was going to do that and play four years and then coach, but I got hurt, couldn't play anymore. 19 years old, got randomly a job offer to be a youth pastor in a little church um, and took that job. And I have worked in churches ever since. So graduated college, went to seminary, and then we planted our church restore uh, launched in February of 2016. So I was in Abilene, which is West Texas for undergrad, and then Dallas area for uh, graduate school, worked at some churches, some mega churches up there, still really in the throes of white evangelicalism up there, um, but began to kind of have a, a deconstruction, reconstruction of my faith um, through, the, through really college and seminary, and then early adulthood. And then through that whole process, kind of this church was birthed in my heart, so to speak, back in Austin, where I just felt like this is what needed to happen. And so, yeah, we moved back here summer 2015 and the church launched early 2016. Dang, that's cool. That's a, that's a cool journey. Um, yeah. You know, that's kind of, for me, like I, I, for the long, you know, I, I started following Jesus or I made the decision at a camp to, to get saved sure. um, is the way I guess it would be phrased then. But I made that decision like, not like with this idea of just like Jesus as just this like thing that saves me. Um, and similar to you, like I didn't really begin to think through like, how does this actually impact like my day-to-day -day life? Um, yeah. And so, you know, I've always, even in the midst of my doubt, like rather it be questions about God or questions about church or, or struggles that I have, I've always been compelled by just Jesus. It's like yeah. this, this guy that like truly presents like this, different way of life and and something i continually so i'm a student pastor and something i continually try and tell students is like if you say that you're a christian and you don't look like you're following jesus then you probably are not a christian yeah and and the, the thing that i present is like he gives us a new way to be human a new way to live life and so you know you this the things that you kind of mentioned i similar i have a similar sentiment. And so I grew up in the Southern Baptist culture. Oh, okay. Um, and, and I grew up, you know, so I went to, it was funny in my hometown, there is first Baptist church of Cordial on one side of the street and literally like less than a football field away is the first United Methodist church of Cordial sure. on the other side. So I would be back. Some of my friends would go there. So I'd be there, but essentially, you know, they were the same for the most part. Yeah. Um, especially I'm, I was in South Georgia, but okay. yeah, so I had, I had a similar similar background and, and like I mentioned earlier the, the impact of like AFR and things like that yeah. um so in your journey like obviously you had questions like early on as a kid mm -hmm. which is is interesting because a lot of kids kind of just they go with the flow mm -hmm. and things like that I have a student that uh, her grandma recently talked to me about 
just in the past, she's had all these questions and I'm like, great, like <laughs> bring her on. Like, and I try to make sure that kids know that they can like, there's nothing Absolutely. wrong with having, having those questions. Like if church is not a place where you can be spiritually honest, then where, 100%. where are you supposed to be? So yeah. at what point did you kind of start, I guess, engaging with those questions in a way to like, maybe reconcile them or maybe just come to the point of like, well, I may not have an answer here. I mean, that's a great question. Um, I would say that it was, I would kind of frame it differently. So I kind of questioned all of it and didn't believe all of it. And then at 17, I have this you know, somewhat radical conversion experience and I just took it all. I just said, okay, well, you know, I fell in love with Jesus. So everything that I learned as a kid that I thought was garbage, that must all be right. And so it wasn't like I kind of went through a process at that point. I just was like, I didn't believe any of it. Now I believe all okay. of it. And it wasn't good. Obviously, it wasn't healthy. Um, and it was also interesting because because of playing football and then playing football in college, um, I really did never go to church. Uh, like I, I was playing or practicing on Sundays and all of that kind of stuff. And so I didn't get involved in a church until I got that job as a youth pastor as a 19 year old. So I wasn't really even exposed to a lot of like, uh, regular teaching or, and I, I read my Bible and stuff like that, but it was mostly in isolation. Again, I was coming out of evangelicalism. It was very quiet time oriented, not a lot of like engagement yeah. with other people, you know, that kind of thing. And so, and I worked some Christian camps and stuff. So occasionally I would hear some things and begin to work some stuff out, but it wasn't really until I was 19 that I began to be like, okay, I got to figure out what I believe. And honestly, <laughs> I think it's still this way. It was because yeah. I had to teach it, right? Like I, I, every Wednesday night I had to teach. Um, and this was, you know, I, I, it was a Baptist church. So it was pretty traditional. Like, you know, youth was expected to be kind of a small version of the regular church service. And so I preached a lot of, you know, almost every Wednesday night. And I did that my entire college career. And so I had to be really prepared. Um, and I don't know what that meant, you know? So it started with like, I'm going to go buy uh, one Matthew Henry commentary from Lifeway and, you know, <laughs> do the best that I can. But at the same time, we were, I was a public relations and advertising major in college, but at the school we were at, um, which was a faith-based school, we each had to take Old Testament and New Testament. And um, it was, there was a seminary attached to the school. It's not there anymore, but um, it was a little bit more kind of open and progressive seminary. And uh, so I had a New Testament professor that really challenged me on things mm -hmm. like what, uh, what are women's roles, like what women can and can't do. Um, what is inerrancy? What does that really mean? So just different things like that. So really through that academic work and then being forced to teach it every week is when I began to uh, deconstruct and reconstruct kind of an entire faith that I just kind of grabbed part and parcel and put in my bag and said, this is what I believe. And then it was a matter of kind of taking each part out of the backpack and being like, do I keep this? Do I throw it away? Does it need to change? Do I put it back? Um, and so, yeah, that, that was a continual process because the I mean, I graduated college and 10 days later, I started seminary. Um, I worked at a, a 45,000 member church during seminary for the first two years where I was doing a lot of weekly teaching as well in small groups and stuff like that. Um, and so again, it was just kind of this combination where I'm reading, I'm learning, I'm studying, and then I'm teaching it. And so it made me really have to understand and be able to articulate what I believed. And now planting a church, I mean, I preach almost every Sunday. And so um, for the last, you know, six and a half years, I've had to do the same thing. Right. And so, um, it's been beautiful in that it really pushes me to continually ask those questions and voice those doubts and work through my kind of faith with fear and trembling, like scripture says, like really try to work it out try to understand what I believe. And I get to see very closely firsthand where that theology leads in a very practical level, but the fruit it produces, so to speak, is it good and healthy Holy Spirit fruit, love, joy, peace, all that stuff, or is it really toxic fruit? Um, and that causes me specifically if it's toxic fruit to go back and re-examine and say, if this is producing something that's not Christ-like, did it start as something that's not Christ-like from a theological standpoint? So those are kind of my, that's kind of my journey of figuring out what I believed and disentangling all the stuff that I kind of was handed as a kid yeah it, you know it's it's really interesting that like for a lot of people it's a professor like that that yeah. presents like because i had the same same thing like and you know at first i began in my undergrad you know i didn't even really th know what calvinism was which you know i got into like 
trying to figure that out. And I was like, yeah. well, this doesn't make sense to me. And so I moved away from that. And it was like all the stuff that I felt like I was being protected from, like in a way, like in, in yeah. my growing up of like, God, defend your faith when you go to college or whatever. I felt like, you know what? I want to engage with these things and kind of see yeah. where this takes me. But I had a Old Testament professor who um really we had a i've mentioned this on the podcast before but we had a first and second kings class and he would come in there and he he would like he's a christian he he loves jesus but he would just want to like make us think and i would go to his office i'd be like okay so you said something in class that's really like bugging me and he was like good and so (laughs) he's even texted me and been like i'm sorry i didn't give you a little bit more answers i was like no it it was necessary so i've had similar i have a similar kind of thing and um yeah well, it really... you, you can you, you can tell i mean this is why god's not dead is about what god's not dead is about right and this is why a lot of fundamentalists are terrified of higher education or education in general and that's why anti-intellectualism runs rampant through a lot of fundamentalist circles right because it is true that if like you are taught a very specific worldview and then you're exposed to something else yeah. um it can be absolutely life changing you know worldview shattering almost and like i think a lot about i grew up in circles where and this was you know the 90s right so evolution was like this huge deal and we were very anti-evolution and it was either evolution or god and so when we were taught things like you know the the death burial and resurrection of jesus was on the exact same playing field as evolution or creation story right and so and then i know so many of my friends and youth group people and all that 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 bought into it wholeheartedly then they get to a freshman biology class and they study evolution like not in a controversial way just like here's the textbook and here's what's going on and they become convinced and blake they've been told right that like a Christian does not believe in evolution. And so when they uh, choose to believe in evolution because they think that's the most compelling case that's been presented, they self-select out of Christianity because a Christian doesn't believe in evolution. They think I must not be a Christian anymore. And I just am heartbroken by that. Um, And I I wish that we, and that's a lot of what we do at Restore is trying to equip people um, to handle those kind of conversations. But if people don't, if like you're a professor, right? If you don't have space to ask those questions, voice those doubts, yeah. go through that stuff, then um, I think it leads to uh, some really unhealthy places. Yeah, I would definitely agree. And something something I've thought through is like a lot of times, like that whole like protection thing, where we gotta keep, we gotta pres- we gotta come up with our own worldview that refutes the worldview we're against. So, like with evolution, yeah. you have like. Ken, what's it ken ham and the whole yeah arc or whatever which is crazy yeah. um so like for some people like when they go to college or they begin to engage with these things because they've never engaged with it there's like this shock yeah. value of they don't know what to do with it and so like what you mentioned like people will walk away and it's like one like that's not even what genesis is trying to do <laughs> right, and that's what right. that's what you know like you know i really appreciate like authors like Pete Enns and like the Bible Project and N.T. Wright and people like yeah. that who have really done a good job of just like, it's all about the lens and perspective in which we approach things with. And yeah. so understanding like, well, what were, what was the intent here? Right. And, you know, so I definitely, uh, I have a similar sentiment that, you know, I learned to just be okay with like, okay, we were, I feel like we were wrong about that. And right. yeah. that's kind of where I'm like, I still, still am following Jesus. So totally. In, in in regards to that, so, you know, some of your, I, I really like a, a lot of your tweets and uh, I, I know you probably get all kinds of messages and like uh, people that respond to it and things like that. Your most recent, you're, you're just discussing that penal substitutionary atonement is actually not the only viewpoint of atonement. And if you, anyone yes. that has, anyone that's done seminary knows that, like, that's not like the end all be all. And it's so funny to see, like, all, I did a paper, uh, like a couple, I think last year on where I had to compare N.T. Wright's approach and John Piper's approach. And, yeah. you know, it's just like two viewpoints. So so what have you seen like in the responses to that? And why do you think like there's such a like defensiveness towards, I guess, like these certain angles? Like why is why do you think that that has, I guess, become yeah. such a, a such a posture that many people have taken? Well, Great question. I think there are a few factors to it. Um, I think that just in society um, and in kind of Western American culture and 
and in the microcosm of white evangelicalism, especially, we have leaned farther into combativeness than, you know, any time in my lifetime, right? I mean, we, I think it's trite to say, like, we're more divided than ever before and all that. And I think, I think that's may or may not be true. I think it is true in a number of different ways, like geographically and some other things like that. Like you don't really live by people that you don't think like anymore. And there's a bunch of different things like that where I think we probably are more divided, but I really think it's deeper than that. I think that we have been given permission to kind of bring the worst parts of ourselves to arguments and conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, it's happened at the highest levels of American political leadership, right? what we saw um, from kind of 2015 on was this massive rise in um, both like kind of really kind of violent rhetoric um, and uh, angry tones. I mean, just just the, the level of discourse just took a huge nosedive, but also that there wasn't a lot of value in what I would consider like uh, fact based reasoning. Right. Yeah. Um, that kind of it, it just became like, who's the loudest, who's the most boisterous, who's the most confident. And so what you have is a lot of people replacing intellectual arguments with loudness and thinking that that makes them right. And so I've seen that just, you know, via social media, take a huge spike um, in the way that people engage over the last few years. It's gotten even significantly worse, I think, over the last couple of years. Um, so I think that's one part of it. Yeah. I think the other part, honestly, is what I was just talking about, with, which is this equating of some of these, what you and I and most like, uh, you know, seminary uh, educated folks or, or people that have even just kind of studied theology would say, these are very like kind of secondary issues or tertiary issues. There's been an equating of those things with the heart of the gospel. And so you you talked about this weekend, right? I, I had a few tweets about PSA, penal substitutionary atonement and kind of tried to give a little pop version of Christus Victor with yeah. some other things that's kind of more of what I ascribe to and recapitulation and some other stuff. And anyway, I got a ton of people that disagreed, a ton of people that brought scripture, a ton of people like, what about Isaiah 53? And which is all fine. Like I, I, I'm totally fine having those conversations. Um, but what I got that was a little bit surprising was so many people saying penal substitutionary atonement is the gospel. If you lose penal substitutionary atonement, you have lost the gospel. And that happens with penal substitutionary atonement. It happens with eternal conscious torment in hell. It happens with uh, traditional sexual ethic. It happens with complementarianism versus egalitarianism, women's roles. People will say, if you give up this thing, you've given up all of it, right? And it's um, the kind of the classic slippery slope argument. And so yeah. it's... I, it's impossible to have a an actual dialogue with someone who says penal substitutionary atonement is the gospel. And that's why I kind of try to say like, hey, I realize that you believe that this is rooted in scripture, both Old and New Testament and that some of the church fathers reference it and stuff. But but it's it's widely accepted that this did not come forward as an actual atonement theory until the 16th century with Luther and Calvin. And they were kind of the first to fully articulate it. And then really it wasn't until the 19th century with Charles Hodge, where it became really widely popularized. And the vast majority of like Eastern Orthodox and other kind of Christians around the world today still don't hold to penal substitutionary atonement. So my thing is like, if you think it's equal to the gospel and you think that you have to get the gospel right in order to go to heaven, then you're saying essentially the first 16, 1700 years of the church, the vast majority of people did not go to heaven because they did not understand penal substitutionary atonement. And I want to like, and I, I try to say it in kind of like, you know, jabby ways to try to help people think, but like, just understand how ridiculous that is and how arrogant it is for us to be like, oh no, nobody else got this right. And because they didn't get it right, like they didn't get the gospel right. Um, and I guess if, if you have, this is a little bit of a tangent, but it connects. So with eternal conscious torment, right? Eternal conscious torment in hell, um, which is essentially the idea for your listeners, right? That um, if you are not saved or have salvation through Christ, whatever that the means by which that happens, you spend eternity in hell um, being consciously means you're like awake and engaged, tormented or tortured, right? That's eternal conscious torment. Um, that is the ultimate trump card, right? Yeah. And so if you're saying the alternative to you not believing penal substitutionary atonement is eternity being tortured in hell, you should probably believe it then like it really allows you to do whatever you want, talk however you want, you know, 
be mean to people however you want, um, even be physically violent, like we saw with like, you know, insurrection and other stuff like that in the name of Christ. Like it's a, it's very easy to excuse any level of behavior when you say the other side means that people will eternally be tortured in hell. And I think that has emboldened people to a kind of an, an ultimate ends justify the means strategy to do whatever they think is necessary to get what they want. Yeah. And, and the thing with that is like, so essentially like, and like you mentioned for the listeners, that, that is that idea of like, you know, Dante's Inferno, like the yeah. flames. And and that's what was very big in, um, I forget what era it was, but you medieval. had, pre- yeah, medieval era where you had preachers yeah. that were going around and like, there's an interesting, uh, so have you ever seen the movie Luther? Um, yeah. yeah. So they have that one scene where they're like, creating fire and smoke and and trying to create this fear of like and and so that was so there's a lot that goes with all that and you know i i you know my viewpoints on it are i i've always struggled with a lot of that just with the uh, looking at the passage and the context that it was written in like what does that mean and i you know i think that i'm always fluctuating i don't i don't know i don't think i hold eternal i don't hold that at this point in my life um i did at one point i mean that's what i grew up in and i've used that Um, but yeah, we could get into that, but it's a, it's a lot, but so like what I want to kind of go towards is, you know, so you mentioned how there's like this combativeness. Mm -hmm. Um, what, so what I find interesting is like the everyday person that's like dealing with these questions, that's not like the seminary person or whatever, or someone that's going to engage with this stuff. I think that that combativeness, like for me and you, it's like, okay, whatever. But for that person, it's like, well, dang, like, what do I do here? Like, and I think that's yeah, where people absolutely. struggle. And so I'd like to kind of hear your thoughts on like, you know, your church, obviously like you, you're trying to get, like give people a place where they can wrestle with these things and be spiritually honest and, and, and it be an open place for these conversations to take place, which I think is like really awesome. Like I, I, I really appreciate that y'all are doing that, that you're doing that you're leading that way. Um, What has been like, what have you seen for people that are looking for a place like that and don't have it. Um, and when they find like y'all's church, like what, what have been some of the kind of reactions to, to maybe, I guess, first time people that visit or people that realize like, Oh crap, it's not just me. I can like have these questions. Yeah, man. Um, so we meet in the middle school, uh, kind of about a block from downtown Austin, right. And kind of the heart of the, when you think of like the weirdness of Austin, um, we meet in middle school right there off of a main road called South Congress. And we, uh, so we've been portable the whole time, set up and tear down. But there's a couple of things that happen. So there's some people with such deep church wounding and trauma that even going into a church building is difficult for them. And so um, a lot of our people are invitational, very specifically about the middle school and being like, hey, we're not even in a church building. We like, you know, build a stage and, you know, have a band in a middle school. And people are like, oh, that's intriguing. And there's like the kind of live Austin connect, live music connection in Austin and all yeah. that stuff that, that they find intriguing. So that's thing number one is like aesthetically from the moment that you drive into the parking lot, like it doesn't look like a church, it doesn't feel like a church. Um, and we are very relentless with our people who are our connection team is what we call it, our greeters, right? We purposely have like a very, um, like anybody that wants to greet that is kind of, you know, good at it, like can be out there. It's not like a dress code. Um, you have to look a certain way or be like a certain level of attractiveness, like sometimes happens in very glitzy churches. Um, the, the one qualification is you have to be just crazy kind. Like that is what we're asking you to do is just like if somebody and we tell people all the time, like, think about it. This was somebody giving church one last try. How would you want to treat them and mm-hmm. treat every single person that way? And so when I so fast forward a little bit, I invite people um, from the stage every week to either go to coffee or Zoom or something like that. Every new person. So I'm like, hey, one time, if you're new, fill out the connection card. I'll take you to coffee. I'll do a Zoom, whatever, um, really to let them kind of interview us. Right. Because we realize that trying to find a church specifically after church trauma is really difficult. And you want to know, you don't want to have to go sit somewhere for six months to like figure out who they are, what they believe. So we let them just come and interview us and say whatever they want. But I I tell you that to tell you that a lot of times when I go to those coffees and I ask, what was your experience like? They don't first mention the sermon or the music or the kids programming. The first thing they mention is the people at the door. And they were like, I've never met people that nice. 
Um, and so that is like a huge part of it. Then they go in, they sit down and we have like kind of an opening song, which is like pretty traditional, like it's starting kind of you know, thing. Yeah. But then the first thing that we do after that is that we show a welcome video and we've shown the same video every week for six and a half years, except one week we were like, let's not do it. And then people revolted and they were like, where's the video? Bring it back. So we were like, all right, sorry. Um, so we show the same video. It's on the front page of our website every single week. And it is like, it, it just spells out all of the stuff we've been talking about, right? Mm -hmm. It says no matter your age, race, gender, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, lifestyle, background, you're welcome here. This is a place where you can bring your doubts and your questions and your concerns and your struggles. This is a place where no matter where you are on the spiritual journey, you can find community and help and hope. This is a place where we lock arms and work with nonprofit organizations to help people that are in need all around our city. This is like, we, we just, it's a minute and a half, right? And we just play it. And a lot of times when I go to those coffees with people, specifically with like really bad church trauma, again, I'll ask them what their experience was. And after the greeting, they'll say, you know, I sat down and a lot of them will say I was shaking. I was sweating. I was nervous. I, I hadn't been in church, especially with COVID. Right? I hadn't been in church in three years, four years, five years. And, uh, you know, the, the first song played and I'm like kind of looking around and trying to figure out, like, should I stay? Should I bail? And then that video plays. And I just took this huge sigh of relief. And I thought, OK, I really am safe here. And we've also trained our folks like whoever's doing announcements or the welcome, which is right after that video. One of the things we say almost every week is, hey, this is your first time. The, the main thing we want you to know is that we believe everything that we said in that video. It's not just like a prop or something like that. And so way before the band or the sermon or anything like that, we are trying to create an environment um, where people can feel that safety and that comfort. Um, and we've taken it a step further over the last year as we've added a lot of um, accommodations for folks like folks with special needs, um, mm -hmm. folks with um, neurodivergence and things like that. So we offer like headphones and um, squishy toys and like all kinds of stuff like that too, because we know that especially some people who are coming in again with a lot of trauma, like even just having a little like squishy thing in their hand that they can hold on to is really helpful um, to kind of like, you know, work out a little bit of that. Uh, physical anxiety that's popping up. Yeah. Um, so once that all happens, and if somebody sticks to actually answer your question, they'll, they'll essentially just say like, I just didn't know this was possible at church, right? I didn't know this type of culture, this type of atmosphere, this type of inclusion was possible at church. And a lot of it, when I press a little deeper, of like, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by all that stuff? They'll say, essentially, I didn't know it was possible for my values to actually align with my faith. And my whole life, I felt like my values of justice and inclusion and welcoming all people and um, sacrificial love and you know caring for the poor, like all these values I've had my whole life, I, were to I was told they were in conflict with Christianity. And for the first time in my life, I feel like my faith and my values can actually go together because I know deconstructionists or whatever that terminology is like get a bad rap, right? Of like, they're just trying to throw away faith. They're trying desperately to hold on to it, man. And yeah. like, I have, I might like, get emotional talking about this, but I just have so much love and respect for the people at Restore and so many others that I meet online and other places that have been through so much at the hands of the church and Christians and pastors and are still trying to hold on to faith, still trying to figure it out. Um, and that's a level of, honestly, like, that's a level of faith that I'm not sure I would have. Um, and I just have, it, it strengthens my faith. I have tremendous respect for it. Man, that's, that's really cool. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, I, I think the the big thing that the church in general, and it sounds like that, this is what y'all are doing is like, how do we make sure people know that like Jesus truly wants you? Like Jesus yeah. is not. Jesus is not like who you may have seen in your pastor or, or the right. church structure you were in or the theology book that you read or or whatever it may be, or like the podcast that you heard. Like, and, and so like, you know, it's kind of crazy that like we have to, and, and I'm glad that you do it, but it's kind of crazy that we have to be like, make sure we're kind to people. Absolutely. You know what I mean? It's like, and, oh, and no. that's like something that, you know, I like continually am, you know, trying to work through is like, I find myself the closest to God in the moments, not, I mean, personally, not necessarily when I'm reading scripture or yeah. even when I'm in prayer, 
but when I am uncomfortably serving people. Yeah. Like, so like this last Sunday, I I was getting ready to go to church and I was teaching um that morning or whatever. And uh this guy that lives in our apartment complex, his name is Bruce, and he was like, Hey buddy, he's like, Can I get a ride? And honestly, I was kind of running behind and I was like, yeah. bro, I don't and I and I was like, bro, you're about to go tell people about Jesus and you're not yeah, gonna yeah. get them. <laughs> and so, you know, my day the the day was was made like it was a good day yeah. because I chose to serve and chose to yeah. be kind. And and just that like approach and like that challenge of what Jesus presents of like are you going to follow me? Like, it's going to, it's going to be sacrificial. And Absolutely. you know, that me that's in that, that posture of like washing feet of like, yeah. the, and you may not be literally doing that, but you can do that like figuratively with your life. Oh yeah. And so, yeah, man, I'm, I'm continually challenged like by Jesus. And I you know th that that's, that's awesome. That's really encouraging to hear um, just that there's a place for um, people to come in Austin and, and, and approach that because I know, you know, especially like, I mean, Texas is still, I know Austin's pretty, it's a city, but in Texas, I'm sure y'all have a humongous influx of people from a very evangelical culture that they've been, Absolutely. they can't do it no more and they, yeah. they still want to follow. And so I think that's really cool. I, I saw, Thanks, um, man. I saw your, I think you posted a photo recently where I think, are y'all doing some forms of like community groups of some kind or something where y'all are engaging in discussion around some of the things that we're talking about. I think that's what I saw. I'd love yeah. to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, we, we do a number of different things. Um, we, we try to employ a really simple model where we essentially do Sundays. We do small groups. And sometimes those are based um, just around community. Sometimes they're based around like we do book clubs or stuff like that. And then we, we do partnerships with people in the uh, nonprofit organizations. Okay. And so um, that, that middle one, so we have 11 different nonprofits that we work with on a regular basis. Um, some faith-based, some not, uh, about eight of them in the city of Austin, and then two or three that are international or national. Um, and so we highlight one a month, we mobilize people and funding to those every month to do projects and all of that kind of stuff. So we don't have any kind of internal like yeah. missions or ministries or things like that. We just partner with existing organizations. But what you're asking about is, um, we really try to uh, I, I realize that um, even as someone who preaches most weeks, that the sermon is, uh, there's a lot of limitations to it, right? It's it's not a dialogue, first and foremost. Um, it, it can be, you can try to make it a little bit dialogue-ish, uh, but it's really difficult. And um, we have like a, uh, a pretty kind of like, you know, more serious intellectual crowd. They're not just like, you know, randomly raising their hands and like yelling back at me and stuff, right? So um you can do little things, but in reality, it's not a dialogue. Um, and it's, it's really not a place where you can, um, kind of go back and forth with multiple topics, right? Like you're trying to kind of stick to one thing and not like allow it to go to a bunch of different things in a sermon. And so we try to do is create spaces where people can have more engagement with that. So we're always running a book club. Usually I'm running one and another one of our pastors, um, one of our female pastors is running one. Um, this last summer, we ran two Bible project classroom classes. If you're familiar, yeah. Yeah, those are dope. They're great. Um, so we've got a, a guy in seminary who's who's going through that, um, who, who led those two. We just call it like Restore Summer School um, and partner with the Bible project to do that. So yeah, we're just constantly trying to give people those spaces to, to go a little bit deeper, to ask some of those questions. Um, and then every summer, last thing, every summer we do something called Summer Mixtape where I spend six weeks bringing in <clears throat> very diverse voices about very diverse topics. And uh, COVID meant that we actually, a lot of those were interview based. So I do what you do and bring in a number of different people and talk about a number of different things. And um, usually it's a lot, not always, but a lot of times it's authors, right? And so there's like a next step of like, hey, if you wanna go deeper on understanding like, you know, racial justice or Christian nationalism or uh, whatever it is, right? Like here's a book that we can go deeper with. And so, it's been amazing over the last couple of years. We've had like uh, Kristen Dumay and Beth Allison Barr and Jamar oh, Tisby nice. and Lisa Sharon Harper and um, yeah, Scott McKnight and just tons of people oh. like that who yeah. uh, have talked. Scott talked about, you know, abuse in the church. How do we create, uh, you know, these healthy Tove churches? And then we, and we had a, a book study launch out of that. Um, so, yeah, we, we just are constantly trying to give people those resources um, to be able to go a little bit deeper in the uh, engagement with their faith. 
That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that like, like you said, I think that what's really appreciated or what I appreciate and what I think people appreciate is that you realize that like, cause it, it's easy to you do the sermon and it's like, that's it. But yeah. I think like giving people that place to be like, Hey, um, I'm not really sure I get what you were talking about. And, and like, yeah. I guess opening yourself up to that. And I think every, anyone that teaches should be able to have some, some vulnerability in that. Uh, and you know, the thing I go back to is like, man, just can, we got to keep on letting people know that they're in a safe place to ask questions that 100%. Jesus was, Jesus didn't give like boundaries to questions. Like, right. you know, what, what I find I, my favorite quotes by Jesus are when he's like, you've heard it said. But yeah, yeah. I say this and it's like he was continually churning and giving. And obviously that's Jesus and he can do what he wants. But like, <laughs> I just think it, it it presents us this like ability, have this posture of like wonder and awe and and really, really engage with those questions. So, yes. yeah, man, and there should I, be. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, no, no, you're good. Be, there should be a lot of humility that comes with that. Right. Yeah. Like and and it should be this posture of like and, and I try to do this with with teaching. Right. Of just being like this is kind of where I am right now. This is what I'm learning. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to share it with you and like, let's see if it's helpful and go from there. But like, yeah, yeah. The, the way that Jesus was constantly kind of leading people through really a, a deconstruction, a reconstruction of faith. I mean, those are deconstruction, reconstruction statements, right? Deconstruct <laughs> yeah. this thing you've heard, reconstruct this new thing. He did it with the guys on the road to Emmaus. I mean, he did it a number of times. And that the fact that Jesus spent so much of his life doing that should help us have this posture of humility and curiosity and awe um, instead of, you know, pride and arrogance and certainty and all that stuff that I think is prevalent in so much of the Western church today. And I think honestly, it's just such a turnoff for the vast majority of people who want to engage with faith. And um, I feel like, you know, when we were kids, maybe a lot of it was like, our questions weren't even answered, right? They just told us to like pray or have more faith or don't ask those questions. And that sucked, obviously. Yeah. But now it's, it feels like less of that. I think people understand that's not true or helpful, but it's been replaced with just like, well, here's the answer. And if you don't get behind this, then you're out, right? Yeah. And so I'm not sure that's any better, you know? Yeah, yeah, I definitely would, would share the same sentiment. And like yeah. the thing that has helped me the most is coming to the place of being like there's actually like so many approaches and so many viewpoints across christianity not just like really? protestant you know i've I, i've recently one of my favorite interviews i've got to do was with um sister joan chittister who and i mentioned her recently in an interview talking about how it impacted me and she's like a catholic sister and so That's awesome. you know she just offered like she wrote this book with these like it's like 50 chapters they're short but there are all these different spiritual like approaches like silence and solitude mm. and prayers and things like that. And so like for me, like all I grew up in was like, read your Bible in the morning, quiet time. Right. And I was like, okay, I'll try. And, yeah. but so for, for me and, and like just listening to like Orthodox fathers and, and, and things like that. So for me, like realizing like, okay, wait, I can actually pull from a lot of different places and, and, Absolutely. Maybe I won't come to a conclusion, but maybe I'll find things that are helpful. And so yeah. I think that that's been really beneficial for me, at least. And, and I hope no, that I has. That. Yeah. Yeah it's, yeah. it's good stuff, man. So thanks, man. I, I really appreciate, you know, what all you're doing. Um, so people can find you on Twitter at, is it, it's Zach, yeah. at Zach W. Lambert. If you just type in that's Zach right. Lambert, I'm sure you'll come up. Um, you know, if you have any last words for like, I guess maybe a listener who is maybe, maybe someone that is someone struggling or just kind of like working through some of these questions, what would your, what would your thoughts be to them? Man. Um, well, I appreciate you having me. Uh, yeah. and I really enjoy this conversation. I think I would maybe just emphasize what you just said about how, uh, there is a deep, rich history, um, a depth and a breadth to our faith. For the last 2000 years, across thousands of miles and languages and cultures, people have been trying to follow Jesus for a really long time. Mm. And to say that somehow in the 21st century, you know, white American evangelicalism, we've like finally figured it out, it is just tragic to me. Um, and there's a whole slew of implications, negative implications that come from that. 
But instead of focusing on those, I would leave your, your listeners with this idea that you really can look back and look around and pull from all these beautiful faith expressions. Um, I, I read a ton of, of uh, you know, Father Greg Boyle, who's a Jesuit priest, um, who's doing incredible advocacy work in LA and started Homeboy Industries. You know, and he comes from this, this Jesuit social action thing that's hundreds of years old. Um, you know, reading a lot of liberation theology, both the kind of South and Central American oh. Gustavo Gutierrez stuff, but but James Cone and Dr. King and all of these people that have been stalwarts of the faith for you know centuries. They have a lot to offer us, and so instead of always, I think, looking forward for like what's next and how do we figure this out and what new thing are we discovering, maybe we should do a little bit of looking backward and looking to the side and, and pulling from some places that. Jesus has been working from in a long time. Cool. That's awesome. Well, man, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, hey, if, you, if you're a listener and you're in Austin, hey, check out R- Restore Austin. If you're looking for a community to maybe re-engage with your faith or continue to engage or try something new, if you're just traveling through, through Austin and you're there on a Sunday or whatever, hey, check it out. Google, find the address, go there. Um, definitely support what y'all are doing. Um, thanks, man. thanks, man. I really appreciate you coming on Rethinking Christianity. It's great to have you. Thanks, man.